I'm Professor Sarah Harper. I'm the Professor of Gerontology at the University of Oxford, and I also direct the Oxford Institute of Population Aging, which looks at the implications of the increasing aging of the world. And the talk tonight is called Extreme Aging. So good evening and welcome to the seventh of the 2017 Darwin College Lectures on the theme of extremes. Now there are two certainties in life, as we all know, death and taxes. I don't think Charles Darwin said much about taxes, but he wrote about birth. Of course, for natural selection to work, the parents must eventually remove themselves so they don't compete by taking resources from their offspring. So the obvious evolutionary tax on birth is death, stopping the uh, parents using up the uh, resources needed by the next generation. Our cells are programmed to die and that's the tax we pay. In Greek mythology, the fates cut the threads of life. In Gulliver's Travels, Swift warns us about the terrible fate of the Sprudelbrugs, immortals who lived on an island and the damage their economic burden did to society. To solve this, once they reached 80, the Strudelbrugs were held incapable of any employment, of trust or profit. Because, as Swift put it, otherwise, as avarice is the necessary consequence of old age, it must end in the ruin of the public. Ah. So, Lewis Carroll is well known for his poem, You Are Old, Father Wheeling. It was, however, a parody of a poem written over 60 years earlier in 1799 by Richard Southey, who became Poet Laureate. What he wrote was, you are old, Father William, the young man cried. The few locks that are left you are gray. You are hale, Father William, a hearty old man. Now tell me the reason, I pray. In the days of my youth, Father William replied, I remembered that youth would fly fast and abused not my health and my vigor at first, that I never might need them at last. That sounds like a message the medical profession would like everyone to heed, <laughs> a healthy lifestyle. So while societies have ever increasing life expectancy, there is substantial variation within and between countries. But is there an absolute limit? Might improving life expectancy increase the risk of years of ill health? Please welcome tonight's lecturer, Professor Sarah Harper, Professor of Gerontology at the University of Oxford and Director of the Oxford Institute of Population Aging. She's come to speak to us on extreme aging. Welcome. Thank you very much and, and thank you uh, to Darwin College for inviting me to give this lecture on extreme ageing. Um, I'm publishing a book with CUP and um, this morning I got an email from my editor who said, I'm really sorry I can't be there tonight because it's his mother's 90th birthday this evening. He said, you're talking on extreme ageing, that sounds horrific. Now I do hope that you're not sitting there thinking this is going to be horrific because extreme aging in many ways is something that we should celebrate because extreme aging from a chronological point of view is that we are living longer and longer to a limited extent or a certain extent in better and better health in order to get to those ages. And rather than have people dying across the life course, we are enabling people to live long, healthy lives, although there is a period of ill health at the end of those lives. So what I want to talk to you tonight is about changes in longevity, that is how long can human beings live, and changes in life expectancy, which in a way, the way of conceptualizing that is how long can populations live. So life expectancy, very simply, is when you have uh, half your population living to a certain age. So it's going to be longevity, life expectancy, how long can we push those back, how long are we pushing those back, should we be doing this, 
and what are the implications? So if we start, this is the world's first supercentenarian. A supercentenarian is somebody who reaches 110 years. And it was Gert Bungard, and we don't know that much about him. We know that he was born and brought up in the low countries of Europe, and we know that he was a foot soldier with Napoleon because he was born in 1788. And he lived until 1899, just before the turn of the century, and he was the longest lived man at that time, 110 years and 135 days. And in fact, he had the record male life until 1966. And the thing to think about is we have always had long-lived individuals. At that time, there were probably about 100 centenarians in the whole of Europe. Now we have about 12,000 centenarians here in Britain alone. So what we have seen, and this is what contributes to the aging of our populations and societies, is more and more and more people reaching these longer years. But we have always had people who've been able to push the boundaries back and live longer. So Jeanne Calmont of France is the longest verified human being. She reached 122. And the longest lived man, a verified man, was a Japanese man, Kimura, and he died at 116 years. And one of the things I'm going to talk a little bit about is these myths that surround our ageing. And definitely one of the myths that many people, and I call it a myth because I think it probably is a myth, but one of the myths that many people, including some scientists, have is that 120 years is the longest it is possible for a human being to live. And one of the things we'll think about is, are we going to break through that uh, at some time? So let's start looking at... Some of the key questions that I want to uh, talk with you tonight. And I think these are really four very key questions that define the whole area of longevity and life expectancy. So number one, will increases in both life expectancy and life extension, or longevity, continue? In other words, will there be a, an increase in the average years lived by humans and the maximum years lived by an individual? Will life expectancy increase in line with life extension? Will we all enjoy the benefits or will it be just for a few? Will increases in life expectancy be accompanied by increases in life extension? Or are we going to see what we call a compression of life extension after probably 100? And will advances in, health, in life expectancy be accompanied by advances in healthy life expectancy? Let's look at the first one, because the first one really is going to frame what I'm going to talk about for most of the lecture. This is, I'm sure you've seen this, the classic uh, expectation of life at birth curve. Uh, on the uh, far side, we have 1841, and on this side, uh, we come up roughly to the current 2012. Uh, and the thing to notice on the far side is a flattening. And in fact, if we're to project that all the way back, one could see that life expectancy at birth stayed at around about 30 to 40 for centuries. And part of that was the huge deaths that we experienced with infants and children and women in childbearing. And then, obviously, infectious diseases, civil strife, etc. And then something happened around about the end of the 19th century. Uh, and life expectancy started to take off, and you can see have consistently risen. So much so that we are expecting at the moment for life expectancies to continue at the rate of two and a half years per decade. Or you can think of it as roughly 15 minutes per hour. So the hour you're sitting here will actually give you an extra 15 years of life to go and do something else. So let's look at these life expectancy figures and how they change. These are the longest lived uh, populations. At the top, we have women. At the bottom, we have men. Uh, Japanese women and French women have consistently had longer life expectancies uh, than other women. Uh, UK and US fall slightly below. And you can see that consistently women outlive men. 
And I won't spend a lot of time talking about that, but the debate at the moment is, is there something biological about women, which means we will always live longer than men, no matter how long life expectancy continues to increase? Or is there something about lifestyles that affects our life expectancy? And we will see a convergence. And I would say at the moment the debate on that is very open. So life expectancy at birth, Japanese women just ahead uh, of French women. And many people have questioned uh, why this should be, because in fact, obviously, the difference between a Japanese woman and a European woman, genetically different, particularly at this age, very different uh, environments in which they grow up, very different, particularly uh, diet and other lifestyles. But why such a difference between French women and UK women? And one of the uh, French demographers, uh, Rabin, he has posited that in actual fact it's not so much between French and British women, it isn't the channel that is the divider, it's actually the line should be drawn halfway across France. So southern French women have longer life expectancies than northern French women, and northern French women and British women have very similar life expectancies, and it's probably to do with our diet. Now, it's more complicated than that, and we'll start to unravel it, but we think probably that is, to date, one of the reasons why we've seen these differences. If we move on to age 65, you can see immediately what happens. Obviously, there are longer life expectancies at every age at age 65 than there were at birth, because these people have come through uh, many of the things that they might have died of. And you can see Japan and France uh, starting to coalesce. And then when we get to 80, in fact, French women live longer at 80 than Japanese women. So at age 80, uh, um, the average life expectancy is 11 years at age 80 for a French and a Japanese woman. This is um, some latest data that just came out last week from The Lancet. Uh, and this is projecting female life expectancy at birth by 2030. Uh, and the reason I want to show you this is because it has broken one of those myths that we had. If we zoom in here on the top 10 countries, uh, these projections suggest, you can see right at the top South Korea, that South Korea by 2030, at birth, their life expectancy will be over 90. And I said that there was a series of conceptions uh, that were around about longevity. Number one was that we would not break through roughly 120 years as the longest lived human being. And number two is that we would never break through age 90 for life expectancy. And it looks, if these uh, projections are correct, that by 2030, that's just in 13 years' time, we may well have broken that barrier that many demographers at the end of last century uh, were saying. Here we've compared South Korea, Canada, France, and Japan, again from the Lancet data, and you can see female life expectancy at age 65 in 2030. Uh, by 2030, they are suggesting uh, that there is a probability, though small, that South Korean women will have 35 years left of life by the time they reach 65. Uh, and again, you can see those uh, top countries are also around about the 30 mark as the most likely, uh, but with this variance possibly going up to as high uh, as 35 or 40. So we really are looking at very long-lived populations, not just individuals, but the entire population reaching these very, very uh, long uh, ages. This is another piece of work. So the first one was basic ONS calculations. The second one from The Lancet came from WHO data. This is data that was published in The Lancet by Christiansen in 2009, and this comes from the Human Mortality Database. And the reason that this is important is that we have demographers and biodemographers from different perspectives using different databases coming out with very similar conclusions. And this one is probably the most stunning one of all. This is the oldest age at which at least 50% of a birth cohort will still be alive. And what this says is that by 2007, half the babies born in Japan will make it to 107, and half the babies born in the UK will make it to 103. And we've already had some very serious demographers saying that they believe that half the baby girls, because remember, girls tend to uh, outlive, uh, male, females outlive males, that half the baby girls born in Europe 
at the turn of the century are likely to make it into the next century. In other words, live more than 100 years. So these are the real life expectancies at the population level that we are now looking at. The implications for this in terms of numbers could be quite striking. This is work that was modelled by a colleague of mine, George Leeson, at the Institute in Oxford, and this is predicting the number of centenarians that we will have by the end of the century. We currently have about 12,000, and the prediction, as you can see, is that we will have over 500,000 centenarians in the UK by the middle of the century, and we will have 1.6 million centenarians in this country by the end of the century. Around about 8 million people who are currently alive in this country at the moment will make it to a century. And the prediction is that about 127 million Europeans will make it to a century. So much so that people call the 21st century the century of the centenarian. And as you can see from those early questions, the really important is, thing is going to be how healthy are these lives going to be? How long can we maintain a health across our life? Because obviously this scenario will be very different if we have people going into frailty at 80 and yet living to 100, 105, 110, or if people can push back the entry into disability and frailty well into their late 80s, 90s, or even would be uh, what we would really hope over 100. This is the projected number of centenarians in the USA, and that is 6 million before the end of the next century. So, the question is, how did we get here? How did this happen? Uh, I just want to pause a little. I love this photo. This is one of the photos we have at the Institute. This is a local Oxford uh, couple, and they celebrated their 70th wedding anniversary. Um, and they were in the papers. They were so proud of being in the papers. Uh, and she died about two weeks after this picture was taken. But it is one of the photos that we use, and we have it in the Institute, because they were such a, obviously, loving couple after 70 years of marriage. But how did we get here? Basically, what we have done is push back death across the life course. The third, what I call fallacy, that I talked about uh, at the beginning, the third one was that death rates post-65 would not come down. Some very well-known biodemographers out of Chicago called um, Oshansky and Carnes, they predicted that although we would see falls in death rates or mortality rates up to 65, post-65, they would always increase. And what we have seen is that the rate of increase in death post-65 has come down. And indeed, most of the kind of gains that we're seeing at the moment in life expectancy is pushing back death post-65. This is the rectangulization of the life curve. Uh, and it goes from 1851, which is the dark line, to 2011, which is the blue line. And you can see that in 1851, there was death across the life course. Big fall in, um, a big increase or high death rates uh, in the first few years of life, in infants and childhood. But once you got out of your childhood and through your adolescence, death across the life course. Uh, what we have done is push death consistently back so that in 1851, half the English population, so I should have said these are English figures, half the English population was dead by 45, and now half the English population can expect to make it round about into their 80s. That's how much we have pushed death back across the life course. You can see this actually happening now. We don't have to look historically, we can see what is happening now in the world if we look at female deaths across the life course and we compare high-income countries, middle-income countries, and low-income countries. And it starts to give us a clue of how this happened. So here we have in our high-income countries, this is deaths, and you can see most of the deaths occur post-60. In fact, huge numbers of deaths are occurring post-75 and 80. In our middle-income countries, we have huge infant mortality still, and then pushing death back. And in the low-income countries, most of this data is sub-Saharan Africa, a few in Asia, massive infant mortality and maternal mortality deaths, and then a flattening, but basically death again across the life course. And one of the reasons why this has happened is if you look at the cause of death. 
So the red is communicable diseases, and you can see that it is very prevalent, attacking all ages, but very much so. Look at these younger ages with the infectious and communicable diseases, far less in our middle-income countries, and almost vanished. So when we're very vulnerable, when we're young, but basically communicable diseases do not kill us in high-income countries uh, anymore. Uh, but we've moved on to chronic diseases. So here, uh, the blue, these are cancer, these are cardiovascular diseases. You can see them dramatically increasing in middle-income countries and absolutely dominating in our high-income countries. So what we see here is what happened between 1851 and currently uh, in England. And the very simple picture is that we started by improving sanitation, we improved nutrition and food, then we were able to bring in public health measures. Then we started to conquer infectious diseases. We had vaccines, etc. And then at the end of the 20th century, we developed geriatric medicine. The pharma industry became very important. And now we really are pushing back older uh, deaths uh, through very high medical intervention. But it was very much a process uh, which occurred. I don't know whether you can see this, but just look at the pattern of the colours. So this is the contribution of mortality decline in three age groups. This comes from that Lancet paper I showed you. Uh, the green are young deaths, the red are midlife deaths, and the blue are old age deaths. Um, the country at the bottom is actually Macedonia, and you can see that both Macedonia and Romania still have a reasonably high, particularly Macedonia, uh, number uh, of deaths in early and midlife, but nearly all the gains in life expectancy that we have seen in these top uh, countries are deaths that have been reduced in old age. That's where the picture is at the moment. So let's just take a snapshot, and again I'm going to use modelling we've done in Oxford on ONS data, looking at male mortality, because I think it gives a very good picture of what happened last century, how we managed to push these deaths uh, backwards. So if you look at the three lines, you have the um, green line, which is respiratory deaths, uh, the uh, blue line is circulatory, the red is infectious, and the yellow line is cancers. And if you start, first of all, let's look at uh, the infections. Um, here, this is, oh, sorry, how do I go back? Go back. Uh, here we have the First World War, the flu epidemic. Here we have infections surrounding and infectious diseases surrounding the Second World War, but basically a flattening. Uh, and I don't know whether you've had um, Dame Sally Davis to come and talk to you, uh, but obviously there is real concern about whether we will be able to continue to conquer infectious diseases in the light uh, of antibiotic resistance. Um, my colleagues at Oxford who work on infectious diseases, what they argue is we will always be able to conquer infectious diseases but the science we have will be able to map the pathogen in the same way that we've mapped the human, but at a cost. So they believe that we will be able to conquer infections, but the, the time of cheap and easy conquering of infections and infectious diseases has gone. But nowadays, basically, you have to be very old or very young uh, to die from infections or infectious diseases. Have a look at respiratory here. This, um, sorry, that was infections in the Second World, First World War, sorry. This is the um, flu epidemic in the uh, First World War, but then basically deaths from re respiratory diseases have more or less gone. We used to talk about pneumonia being the old man's friend, but again, very few people die of pneumonia, and even elderly people succumb to it far less than they used to. The cancer story is very interesting. Again, I'm not a... Uh, a cancer specialist, but again, my colleagues say the flat line across the century is because the incidence of cancer has gone up, but our ability to keep people alive with cancer um, has also gone up. So people tend not to die. They live longer with cancer. But the story that I think is most interesting is this line. This is circulatory diseases. And as you can see, it was more or less flat all the way across the 20th century. Men in particular succumbed to cardiovascular disease and heart attacks. And even when I started in gerontology, the story was that men died early and women survived with chronic disabilities. All that changed 
and it changed round about the 1980s. There were a variety of explanations, but I think it's generally agreed that the overwhelming reason was because men gave up smoking. And so much so, in such large numbers, they responded to a public health initiative. Again, came out of Oxford research, which showed the link between smoking, cardiovascular disease, and um, stroke. Men gave up stroking, and we actually could see it in the national population mortality figures. And here you can see this is smoking prevalence in the over 60s. Just look at the blue, which is men. Um, here you can see up at um, 45, and it goes all the way down, and then basically has been flat uh, around about 15 uh, from the early 90s. What about young people? Because one of the things that people often say is this, you're talking about all these life expectancies, but young people face very, very different uh, factors than the cohorts that have gone before. And particularly, what about young people and the current curse? Because I think if smoking was the thing that killed large numbers of people in the 20th century, then the thing that kills people in the 21st century is probably going to be linked to obesity. And I just want to take you through uh, a survey which I think highlighted some real concerns to the question around life expectancy and healthy life expectancy and goes some way to answer the question, will things like obesity shorten life expectancy or will it, more importantly, shorten our healthy life expectancy? Uh, and I'm just going to show you, um, this should work uh, by itself. This is um, obesity in the United States. And this is a survey that they started in 1986, looking at, by a particular measure, the percentage of the population that was obese. And you can see they had no data. They really weren't collecting data in many of the, the states. Um, and we have blue here, which is less than 10%, and we go all the way down to over 35%. And I'm just going to run this, and it should run by itself. So that's 15% to 19 has come in by the mid-90s. 20% in some states by the end of the century. We've got a third in... So by 2009, there was not a state uh, in the US that didn't have at least 20% of its population obese. Um, I... This is something that um, we often get asked about, and, and we have uh, looked into it. Um, this, I think, is Colorado. And we thought it was a statistical problem. And then somebody pointed out that if you look at a map of... This is pre-Trump. If you look at a map <laughs> of voting behavior in the states, then these are Republican, and these... This is a Democratic state in the middle of a massive... Republicans, so we think the, the, the people who are intelligent and live good, strong, <laughs> healthy lifestyles and aren't obese, um, though I wouldn't take that as um, entirely accurate. <clears throat> the reason why this is important is because of two studies that were done during this time. Um, the prevalence of obesity isn't just in the US. Uh, I've only given you by this particular uh, this is a BMI over 30 for, in fact, in this case, women aged over 50. Uh, and you can see the U.S. is high, but so is Spain and England. And interestingly, one of our longest-lived populations, Japan, in this particular study, uh, had very low levels of obesity. But at the time that this study was done, there were two very interesting uh, meta-studies carried out. And this was to answer a particular question that was concerning the Americans. I'm sure many of you are aware that when you look at both mortality uh, and morbidity rates, the U.S. doesn't do well. It spends all this money on health care, and yet it is below average, uh, particularly uh, in its morbidity success. And one of the questions they wanted to ask was, is this because of obesity in the population? So the question was, how much does obesity in the population account for the unexpected results we get from our mortality and morbidity uh, data. And the first study uh, is the prospective 
a study cohort. It was done out of Oxford, and it ran from roughly the mid-70s to the mid-90s. And the second study was the Meta Chang study, and it ran from the mid-90s to the mid-2000s. And what you can see here very clearly is that the first study explained 41% of the female gap in the expected morbidity and mortality. And the second study, which was done when there was far more obesity in the population, accounted for nearly half that, 22%. So obviously there's been a lot of discussion about why that might be, but one of the reasons that people believe that this is the case is this, pharma. So what happened in the 20th century with smoking is that we had a big public health push. People gave up smoking and they lived longer and they lived longer healthier. What is happening here with obesity potentially is that people are tending not to change their diet and their lifestyle, but they're using drugs. So they're using beta blockers and they're using statins and they're using blood pressure tablets, etc., in order for them to live with obesity and with the chronic diseases that obesity tends to be associated with. In very few cases does obesity kill, but it raises the likelihood of you getting cancer and diabetes, possibly heart disease. And that obviously is a very different scenario which comes back to this question. Will advances in life expectancy be matched by advances in healthy life expectancy? And there have been several studies that have looked at this, but I really like this study uh, which was um, published uh, in uh, Public Health in uh, 2011. Uh, and I'm just going to give you just this one table, but. What this study looked at was the increase in life expectancy versus the increase in disabled years with the three measures, alcohol, smoking, and obesity. And if you just look at the bottom two, they argued that smoking and alcohol added on between, sorry, reduced life expectancy between three and four years in this particular group by the measures they had. It increased disabled years by between three and four. But obesity only reduced life expectancy by 1.4 years, but increased disabled years by nearly six. And this obviously is a scenario that is not going to be particularly supportive of healthy life expectancy if we continue to have the rates of obesity in high incomes uh, within our countries. But there is good news, and I'm very embarrassed having to talk about this because the authors uh, of um, one of these studies, the UK uh, study, Carol Brain from Cambridge is actually sitting in front of me and I'm absolutely terrified I'm going to describe it wrongly. Um, but basically the good news seems to be around dementia. Uh, and this was published uh, in The Lancet in uh, 2015 and many of you may have read about it because it got a lot of publicity at the time. And you need to look at um, Carol's study which is this one and what this suggested in this particular study was that there seemed to be a reduction in both age-specific incidence of dementia and prevalence of dementia in the population. And what the researchers did was they explored a variety of factors and definitely factors around lifestyle, exercise, medical intervention seemed to be important, but one of the other factors that they considered was education. And we know there is a relationship between education and people showing symptoms of dementia. Uh, I think it's generally accepted that it's unclear exactly what that relationship is. Does education protect you from dementia? Or is it that if you're very highly educated, you can hide the symptoms of dementia? But whatever, there is a relationship that highly educated people tend uh, to have less symptoms uh, of uh, dementia. But this was then confirmed uh, just uh, last year by a, a large study uh, in the Journal of the American uh, Medical Association where they found in their particular, this is a big national study coming out of something called the Health and Retirement Study, and they found that dementia prevalence declined significantly uh, from 11.6 uh, in 2000 to 8.6 in 2012 uh, in there, they had 21,000 people over 65. And they believed that one of the overriding reasons was education. 
because this particular cohort that is now going through has, on average, a year's more education than older people previously. And if you go back, it's obviously that America changed the date at which people had to stop compulsory education. And they argued that actually an increase in education at the population level is now coming through into the dementia figures. So there is some uh, light uh, in this particular area if it is that as we educate our populations uh, to a higher level in high income countries, then we may see a reduction in the prevalence of dementia in our older uh, populations. Okay, very quickly, just to summarize this, life expectancy and healthy life years at the European level. Um, we have European countries here, age 65. This is life expectancy, and the same countries down here with healthy life expectancy. And you can see that, if anything, the gap has been increasing. Uh, and when we get to 85, you can see quite a significant gap uh, forming uh, here. So even... If we take this, there is, this is roughly uh, remaining years of life. Here we have five, but the same remaining years of healthy life is three. So this is even at the national level uh, we see this gap occurring. I want to continue to explore this, but actually move on to this question, which, of course, I've been talking at the national level, and yet we have to understand that there is huge inequality in these figures. And I'm going to demonstrate this by putting both healthy life expectancy and life expectancy uh, together. Will we all enjoy the benefits of longevity? Will we all enjoy the benefits of healthy life expectancy? This is um, some work that we recently did for the Government Office of Science uh, in the UK. Um, and it's national figures for England 2012 to 2014. Uh, here we have the most deprived populations and here we have the least deprived populations uh, and the blue is life expectancy uh, and you can see at age 65 in the most deprived they have about 16 years but only six years in good health that's nearly 10 years in not good health and you can see here we have um, up to 20 years uh, life expectancy but only eight years in not good health. So not only do we have inequality in life expectancy, we're seeing growing inequality in healthy life expectancy. And not to dwell too much on this, this obviously has huge social uh, uh, policy implications, particularly around things like care. If you like, those people who are most dependent on benefits are likely to have the longest time uh, with disabled or uh, not healthy life expectancy. I want to look at this in a little bit more detail and draw on some work we recently did uh, in Oxford. This was, uh, we had access to a 2 million UK data set. And 500,000 uh, of our, so half a million of these um, pensioners, or, uh, sorry, pension holders were dead. Uh, and so we could really tr try and tease out what were the factors in inequality uh, behind their deaths. And the reason that this is important is that when I showed you those national figures, remember, that's the whole population. So we have a complete spectrum of those people uh, with all different types uh, of deprivation, education, income, etc. These are only people who've got occupational pensions. So these people already we have lifted out, and we, this is a subset. So these people are in careers with occupational pensions. But look at the difference even within this group. So if we compare UK life expectancies from age 65 with the bottom 20%, which is here, low income, ill health, retiree, unhealthy lifestyle, they had life expectancies of 12 years. Compared with our high group, who this is the top 20%, they tended to have high income, normal health retiree, and a healthy lifestyle, and they had 23%. That's a difference of 11 years in an occupational-based pension system. And when you look at how it spans out as they get older, uh, this is uh, life expectancy um, at age 65. We have the uh, blue at the top is our healthy, our top 20%. The green is our bottom 20%. Uh, and by the time you've got to 85, the probability of you dying the next uh, year uh, is roughly 50%. 
So these inequalities, even with an occupational income-based set, are set and they continue across our old age. We also were able to look at the impact of different factors on longevity. So just to take you very quickly through this, at the top we have our unhealthy group, manual employee, poor unhealthy lifestyle, ill health, retiree, only 12 years at age 65. If they'd done a non-manual non job, they would have added on 0.7, retired in normal health, 1.8, had a high income, 4, but healthy lifestyle. It was having a healthy lifestyle across your life, that would add on 4.6 years. So the picture is beginning to grow. Health has a huge impact on life expectancy and it needs to be across our lives. So let's start coming to the, the last section that we're interested in. Will increases in life expectancy be accompanied by increases in life extension or are we seeing a compression of longevity after 100? And this has been a question that we simply haven't been able to answer. Because of this idea that 120 may be a barrier, there has been this idea that, oh yes, we'll get more and more people to 100, but we will never really stop pushing those boundaries out. Now, mainly because of the Japanese, we have sufficient data that not only can we do uh, very simple uh, statistics on them, but we can also now do biological uh, tests uh, upon them to try and tease out what are the drivers. And at the demographic level, we can say, yes, in Japan, we are definitely seeing an increase in those people post-105, post-110, as we see an increase in the centenarians. So at the moment, we are seeing this increase uh, at least uh, up to 110 and, and possibly uh, slightly before. So let's look at some of the uh, possibilities behind understanding this. We can say that up until now, the determinants in the shape of mortality and morbidity, so that's death and ill health in the 20th century, have been determined basically by healthy living and disease prevention and cure. So the key question is how much life expectancy can we expect to gain without the intensive application of scientific medicine? Can we continue just doing what we've been doing? And if so, how much can we push back life expectancy? And therefore, in a way, what we've been interested uh, in assessing is estimating the impact on life expectancy of delaying the onset of what we know to be age-related diseases rather than eliminating them altogether. So not only can we push back death, can we also push back morbidity, etc. So looking at those two, we now understand the first one is around healthy living, uh, and I'm sure you've all been aware of this, that we now have to eat eight portions of um, fruit and vegetables. I'm a vegetarian, and even I am struggling to get eight portions of fruit and vegetables into me every day. But still, but this was published recently, and I think this is what caused a lot of the publicity in the International Journal of Epidemiology. Um, and this is the percentage risk in developing illnesses comparing two and a half to 10, and basically, not going through it, but heart disease, stroke, cardiovascular disease, cancer, and premature death, they suggest that the difference between two and a half and 10 in all these cases is quite significant. The second one is what we talked about when we looked at the UK, which is looking at current figures, male mortality, deaths per million, and by their cause. So down here, we've got the main causes of death in men in those age groups, and a comparison between 2001 and 2004, and what the reduction was. And you can see, particularly in heart disease, 61% uh, circulatory, 53%. Uh, so we've done very well in pushing back these causes of death. So to date, we seem to uh, have been recently very successful, which probably explains why these life expectancies in high-income countries continue to increase. What about when we move into the future? What about when we move into regenerative medicine and age retardation? And that's really what I want to sort of finish uh, the talk on. The key question is, how much life expectancy can we expect to gain with the intensive application of scientific medicine? Now, just to give you a very broad idea of the kind of things that people are now talking about in the area of what can be called biotechnology. 3D printing, being able to print different parts of your body. Nanotechnology, the new genetics. 
Just to give you an example at different ends of the spectrum, in the laboratory, the kind of advances that are being made. Many of you will be aware of Linda Partridge's group and the fantastic work she has done. This is uh, probably a very familiar uh, slide um, on dietary restriction, uh, where their group has shown quite conclusively that dietary restriction increases health and lifespan in a diverse group of animals. The question is, will it work in humans? But they definitely have done the science behind it. They understand, they believe, what the particular interactions are and how these different factors can eventually impact upon our bodies and therefore upon the possibility of life extension. This one, I think, is even more important. And this is work, we have a group at Oxford who's working on this, but there are about 300 groups uh, across the world who are working on stem cell research, but not on embryonic stem cell research, but on adult stem cell research. And there's obviously been a lot of controversy about using embryonic stem cells. There's a lot of ethical problems. There's a lot of rejection problems. But we now have the ability uh, in the laboratory, at least, and in some trials, to do this, to take human skin cells, to reprogram them, to turn them into stem cells, to turn them into therapeutic stem cells and insert them back into the body. Uh, and, for example, we know that they have, within humans in trials, grown parts of the eye, parts of the heart, and parts of the leg muscle in this way. And, in fact, Paul Fairchild, who runs the Stem Cell Institute uh, in Oxford, uh, has recently uh, been talking about some of the research he's involved with, where they will take human stem cells, insert them into a pig, grow a human heart, and then be able to use that heart for transplantation. So on the one hand, people are really suggesting that this could be a major breakthrough, not in life expectancy, but very much so in longevity. There is, however, a huge problem, because as we know, the idea of cells and proliferation of cells, which is what happens when you have stem cells, is also associated with cancer. And one of these things these groups are not uh, convinced about is in the population as a whole, will they be encouraging an increase in cancer within populations if stem cell therapy is widespread? So it has huge promise for longevity, maybe for a few, but it also uh, has some dangers as well. But definitely in the laboratory, we're seeing the potential for really pushing this forward. However, there is also a growing belief that although these, if you like, these add-ons are useful, there may well be something that is genetic and very complex genetic, not telomeres, but very complex genetic, that means that we will never actually be able to solve the problem for most people of aging. And aging is basically an accumulation of these age-related diseases that eventually end in death. And I just want to quote you uh, another paper from uh, Rabin, uh, who in 2003 uh, was one of the first people to look at the prevalence of extremely old people in Japan. Uh, and they found that in actual fact, these very long-lived people who were over 105 were actually different from those people that were over 100. Uh, and he suggested that they were biologically, in terms of health, uh, round about uh, 10 years uh, younger, in so much as the controls were 10 years older than the people who were of very old age. They progressed, possessed significantly better biological and physiological risk factor profiles. They had less age-related diseases and better physical and cognitive function. And he concluded with the concept of a healthy aging phenotype whereby certain individuals are somehow able to delay or avoid major clinical disease and disability until very far into later life. And there is now a burgeoning group uh, of published research which is coming to the same conclusion, that very, very old people, people who are over 105 or over 110 in particular, they tend not to show the degree of age-related disease you would expect until very late before they die. It's as if they can push back the onset of these age-related diseases, but when they get them, they tend to die very quickly. This is just to give you uh, a couple uh, of examples. Um, so Wilcox's work 
Supercentenarians, these people are over 110, display an exceptionally healthy aging phenotype where clinically apparent major chronic diseases and disabilities were markedly delayed, often beyond the age of 100. Uh, or in 2015, Morris's work, uh, long-lived cases had metabolic profiles that suggested higher insulin sensitivity, etc., and lower glucose levels, lower insulin. But there are a few people who are just different from the rest of us. And if that is the case, then it is very likely that whereas we may be able to extend the lives of a very few people, it is possible that for most people, there is something about reaching 100, 110, possibly 115. And that even though we can replace bits of the body, and even maybe one day uh, conquer uh, the side effects of having dementia or even uh, control the disease itself, it may be that you have to have a particular genetic makeup in order to reach these very, very long lives. So I'm going to conclude by just very quickly taking a pause and saying, what about society in the era of long lives? Not so much longevity, but these huge uh, long life expectancies that we're now facing. And I think there are three things. I'm not going to talk about pensions. I'm not going to talk about health care. I'm going to talk about this. Number one, the generational contract. So most societies in the world have a generational contract, and that says that when we are adults, we produce dependent children, we look after them, those dependent children grow up, and they care for us in our old age. Many people in Western-style societies, and in fact in Eastern-style societies, where this has been very strong, are beginning to question this, and they are saying given that we have cohorts coming through who have been very successful in pushing back death and now are living into older ages, should they not be taking more responsibility for that old age? Should we not be moving to an adapted generational contract? What about this generational succession passing down through our societies, through our families, our communities, our workplaces, power, assets, resources and status. What happens when you don't inherit from your parents until you are in your 80s? Or from your grandparents until you are in your 80s? But that is the scenario we're going to. We are really lengthening those gaps and people, not just Prince Charles, but many other people <laughs> will find themselves in situations where most of their active lifespan, they have parents or grandparents above them. And that will change the way that our societies, our workplaces, our communities, our politics have to work. And then finally this, um, I don't know, this is at Blackfriars Railway Station, probably the only reason you really want to go to Blackfriars Railway Station, but it is the seven ages of man from Shakespeare. And I think you have to ask that with these very, very long lives, are we going to have seven ages or 12 ages, or are we just going to change our life courses completely? A couple of years ago, I was uh, talking to the City of London Boys' School, uh, and they had told me I'd be talking to the sixth form, and in fact, 70 boys eventually arrived, including a group of 12-year-olds. And I thought, how do I talk about longevity to a 12-year-old? When you're 12, anyone over 20 is completely ancient, so I don't quite understand how this is going to work. But I divided them in two, and I said, you're going to live till you're 150, you're going to live till you're 50, how are you going to change your lives? And there was a little boy sitting in the front of the 150 group, and he said, if I'm going to live till I'm 150, I'm not going to start having kids till I'm 80. <laughs> but in a way, he'd got it. So long as we stay fit and active and healthy, we will begin to delay those life transitions. And we're already seeing it. We in this country already know we're delaying the status of full adulthood. It used to be in your early 20s that you left home, you got married, you had kids, you got a job. Now people well into their 30s not only because of the kind of socioeconomic situation they find themselves in, but because they can, are retaining a youthful lifestyle and they're not getting committed and they're not having children. We now are pushing back the onset of first birth in this country. In Europe, uh, age of first birth for women is now nearly 30. It was 22 in 1976. We're already delaying life transitions. And I think the idea that we will go forward in a society where we spend... 25 years in education, we then work till we're in our 50s or 60, and we then are alive for 40 years after that. I think that is unsustainable, and we will probably see far more fluid life courses coming through. But I 
actually also want to finish by a question. Why do we have this grasp for longevity? Uh, there are some people around who believe that the first person who's going to live to 200 or even 1,000 has been born. I think that's very good for stretching out the realms of imagination, but... And they argue that it is an absolute criminal thing that the biggest cause of death in high-income countries is old age. <laughs> no. We've known and philosophers uh, have spoken uh, extensively about death is what makes us human. We have finite lives. And we do have to argue, why is there this rush for this longevity? Healthy life expectancy, yes. Getting as many people as possible to 100 in good health, yes. But pushing the boundaries back, I think, is something we have to start questioning. And this is a wonderful book, which was sponsored by a very dear colleague of mine, Richard Sisman, who um, was head of the Social and Behavioral uh, Institute of the NIH, NIA, National Institute of Aging, who very sadly died in, a couple of, in 2015. Um, and he sponsored this book, one of the first books that looked at the biodemography of longevity. And he called it Between Zeus and the Salmon. And the reason they called it that is this idea that there is a trade-off between the salmon, which has huge numbers of offspring and then dies, and Zeus, who lives forever. And that the human has to find some kind of compromise because one of the reasons why we will go from 7 billion to 10 billion on this planet by 2050 isn't actually because women are having huge numbers of children because across the world outside Africa we're not it's because you could say demographically we're no longer dying on time and a significant proportion of that extra 3 billion are in fact us lot who will still be alive when our children our grandchildren our great grandchildren are alive so we do have a responsibility to our planet and aiming for people to start living these very, very long lives. I think there are philosophical, moral uh, questions. But I want to end uh, with this. Um, this is obviously Starry Night by Vincent van Gogh, and he was very much fascinated by old age, though he obviously died himself very young, and he wrote a letter to his brother about uh, the images he saw in this picture. And he said, when I look up at the stars, I often think that the stars are celestial cities. And just as we take transport uh, to visit Paris and Lyon, etc., so we take different forms of transport to reach the stars. Uh, and if the buses and the trains and the boats are the cholera and the typhoid and the cancer that get us to the stars, then I think the perfect way to end our life is to walk to the stars on foot. And I think that is what we should be aiming for when we look at old age and extreme aging. Thank you. very much indeed for a fascinating and challenging lecture. Initially, you know, increasing longevity sounds pretty attractive, provided, of course, it comes with, with good health. But as Sarah has just explained, you know, and described the impacts are very wide-ranging and potentially very difficult. Uh, the environmental, societal and, and political consequences of aging populations and the decreasing proportion of young people will present a broad range of very difficult problems, problems that are, will be different in, in every country. Churchill said there's no finer investment for any community than putting milk into babies. I just wonder what you know, this increase in uh, dependent population is, is, is going to mean? How will our societies plan for this change? Of course, those of us with gray hair are going to you know, experience this sooner than the others. And, but potentially, for those of you who, for whom gray hair is many decades in the future, the consequences will be much more severe. 
it's part of this generational contract. So thank you very much indeed, Sarah, for giving us a lot to think about. Next week, uh, the final lecture in this year's series turns from population demographics to the much more immediate experience of those who bring the news from distant, dangerous, and extreme situations into our homes. So Lise Doucette, who is the BBC's chief international correspondent, will be speaking on reporting from extreme environments. And finally, to end, please thank Sarah Harper once again. Thank you.